You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. Even at like 20, I could drink all night, you know. And then all of a sudden I found cocaine. And then all of a sudden we'd be in one place, the cocaine would arrive. I'd have the cocaine and we'd go to the next place as though we'd just gone out for the night. We'd been out for like five or six hours and then all of a sudden we could start again, you know. So that was a terrible thing for me, finding cocaine. And then all of a sudden cocaine becomes more than the drinking and then, you know, it uh, you're up for days on it, you know, just sitting there talking bollocks. With my cocaine addiction, I was always careful that I never took cocaine while I was playing because I think it was like four or five days to get out of your system and we used to get uh, urine tested so I never wanted to get caught for that and lucky enough, touch wood, I never, I always made sure that I was like a week clean before I played. Because you're in people's front rooms like three or four times a year for like two weeks at a time, people sort of think you know you and in them days there was only four channels, you know, so, it, you know, it, it becomes sort of, um, you know, you was famous, you know, girls were like talking to you, wouldn't give you a second look. You know, uh, you was getting roped off in nightclubs, you wasn't paying for drinks, it, it was crazy. And I did get, you know, carried away with it and took full advantage. Lucky for me, I went to see my doctor as soon as I felt it. And he said, I don't like that. He sent me to a specialist and then I had the operation and I had it taken out. And it was the type of cancer I had that if I wouldn't have got it checked out and it had gone anywhere else, I wouldn't be here today. Boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got snooker legend Jimmy White. How are you, Jimmy? I'm good, James. Nice to see you. Abs listen, mate, absolute honour to be Thank you. sitting across from you. Snooker legend. Everyone loves you. The people's champion. Won over 20 events, 10 ranking events, been in the World Championship final six times. People adore you, mate, and obviously because of the crazy fucking life that you've led as yeah. well, and you're very upfront about it. Yeah. How are you, brother? I'm very well, yeah. I'm in a good place. I'm really enjoying my snooker, and uh, life's very calm now to what it was. First for everything, Jimmy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you won a... a, a a game yesterday I heard against a very a good opponent, very up and coming as well. Yeah, Aaron Hill, a good player from Cork in Ireland. Um, he fancied a job. And Stephen Henry, your fellow Scott, was commentating yesterday and he said that, um, you know, these kids don't know who we are. So they're sort of super confident. But I played well yesterday, so I'm quite proud of myself. How does that make you feel still winning games like that? Well, I still... Like, as we'll probably talk about my lifestyle in a bit, years ago I didn't really used to practice because I was so ill, you know, through uh, the drink and drugs. That I, you know, I didn't, when I was very young I used to practice. But now because I'm semi-clean, I can practice and uh, put in the hours, so I'm pretty sharp. Yeah. Wait, do you know 61? No, 59. 59? Oh, 59. threw on an extra two years. He hasn't years done his homework. <laughs> <laughs> I always go back to the start with my guest, Jimmy. Yeah. Where you grew up and how it all began. Well, I, my, my, my mum was a, used to clean a hotel on a Friday and my dad was a carpenter. And my day um, with my dad was on a Friday afternoon. He used to pick me up from school and I'd spend three or four hours with him. And in them days, it was down the pub. You know, it was a Friday. The boys were getting paid. And... Uh, I, for the, for about the first three months, I was in the lorry. You know, I didn't come in the pub. And then I come in the pub and there was a pool table there. And within six months, I'm playing pool. I'm beating everyone at pool. And then I found uh, a snooker club called Zans in Tooted. And I went in there, see these big tables, fell in love with the game, been in love with it ever since. For a very young age, was there any family members or anyone play snooker or pool? Uh, no, my, a couple of my brothers played a little bit of snooker, you know, in in a United Service Club where I used to go, my dad's club, but no, I was in the snooker on my own and uh, all of a sudden by the now time I'm like 14, we're earning lots of money gambling. It's a wrong environment for a child, you know, I've got grandchildren, you know, they'd never see anything like it, you know, and uh, 
we used to, there was no internet in them days, no mobile phones. So we literally put a, a pin in the map, we went right, Newcastle, and me and Tony Mio and this um, called Dodgy Bob, this black cab driver, used to get in, our, in his black cab, drive to Newcastle, and stay there for three days in like bed and breakfasts, and we'd, we'd clean up because, you know, guys who were good players in Newcastle would come along and go, well, these kids can't beat us. And everyone would back them and we'd win. You know, sometimes, you know, we could come home with like a thousand pounds. We've won, we've won like four or five thousand. He had the majority share, the taxi driver. And we'd come home with that kind of money, you know, at 13 years of age. That's like, you five, know, that, that's grand, 47 then. years ago. It's a lot yeah. of money. Why was the cab driver taking more? Well, because he had the wheels and he had the stake. You know, we didn't have any money, mm. because especially me. Tony Mio was a bit careful with his money, but I was always, as soon as I got my money, I was, you know, I was gambling it even at a young age. Were you ever threatened, especially grand, uh, adult clubs and winning money? Oh, no, a lot of times we had to, we won all the money and we had to say, we, okay, we just want to leave with our lives, you know, you keep all the money, because you could tell, you could feel the atmosphere in the snooker. Not only have they been beaten, and they've taken all their money, they feel a bit humiliated, you know, even though we didn't hustle them because we just beat them. But, you know, you could tell sometimes it was best to just give the money mm -hmm. back. So. so it wasn't like the forums where people maybe lose a couple of frames and then put the money down and say, we'll play you for money and then, and then yeah. beating them? No, yeah, no, we didn't have to hustle them. As I said, we could just yeah. play them. Because we were so young, people think that they, they'd beat us anyway. What were you like at school, Jimmy? No good at all. My maths was all right. And, um, Count money. <laughs> yeah, yeah my, you know, I sort of, uh, you know, I, I can read, I read, I can read. I, if I wrote you a, a letter, which I probably wouldn't do, but if I wrote someone a letter, I'd make a few mistakes. So academically, I'm not great, no. Was that one of the reasons why you never went to school as much? Um, well, lucky enough for me, my... Um, headmaster called Arthur Beatty realised that academically I wasn't very good and he and he, I'd been in the local papers then but winning a few matches so uh, he thought it was a good idea to let me if I went in in the morning I'd done a deal with him where I didn't go in in the afternoon so that worked well for both of us and you know lucky for me touch wood I went on to uh, do well at snooker. How did your mum and dad treat you? Well mum and dad you know my mum's you know mum like was obviously scared, you know, when I'd go and stand in the dodgy hotels, <clears throat> excuse me, um, you know, going away for three or four days at 14 and 15, you know, she'd be worried about us because it wasn't, you'd have a phone in the house, but it wasn't like you can get in touch like now. So she was a bit sort of, um, but my dad sort of knew that I knew how to look after myself because the snookles are like a very educational place in a way, you know, you, you learn your principles and you learn uh, not to take liberties with people, you know, and uh, I was brought up, um, all about manners in my in my household as well. So uh, my dad knew I'd be all right, you know. Were you drinking at fourteen or anything at um, like that, that time? Occasionally, not not really. Sort of more when I was like sort of sixteen, I started drinking. Because did you win the world junior championships at sixteen? I won the English amateur championships at sixteen, and, and that's we, the youngest ever to do that. Youngest ever to do that. Yeah, he got beat about ten years ago by a kid called David Gray, and. Um, so it lasted a long time and that. And then I'd done that in 79 and I could have gone to two uh, world championships and I decided to wait to go to Australia to be world amateur champion. Lucky enough, I won that. But I missed two years at the Crucible. And looking back at it now, Steve Davis in 1981, he'd been there in 79 and 80, lost to Alex Higgins and Dennis Taylor. And then in 81, he beat me in the first round, 10-8, I was 6-1 down. And he went on then to win everything. So maybe, on hindsight, if I didn't go to Australia, I could have had two years as a professional, you know, learning the ropes. But um, it wasn't to be, and he obviously went on in the 80s to win a lot more than me. Yeah, do you think that two years away then maybe held you back an extra inch? Absolutely. But a big mistake looking back now. Yeah, hindsight's always a wonderful thing yeah, though, I know, isn't it? You know, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but you know, it was, if if I were to sort of, because you know, to win the World Amateur Championship, you got no prize money or anything for it. You just got the cup of winning, you know. So I have got it up there somewhere. There. So, you know, I'm delighted that I won it, but not... You know, looking back, I'd have had 
two more years experience as a, a professional you know yeah what about growing up in the streets of london were you surrounded by many people or did you try and keep yourself to yourself um in the snow court it was like a the snow court was like a family sort of run place it was it was run by um a guy who owned it and they had like it was a crazy place there was a there was a guy called um ronnie fryer and uh, he used to come in, very small, thin guy, but if anyone was sitting on the tables, you know, you'd get a slap, or if you'd whistled, you get you got barred for a week. You know, it was a very, like, strict environment, but it was also, it was a very bad place as well, you know. It was like a shoplifter's paradise. All the tables were, no one went shopping in the shops at Christmas. They went in the snookles because it was all full of uh, stolen goods and all that, you know, but... There was there was good principles in a way in there, you know, because if you was like a burglar, you know, you, you was barred, you know, if they heard you rob someone's house or something, you know. So it, it was um, a dangerous place, but also once you knew the ropes, it was a safe environment. Did you feel at home inside the snooker hall? I felt sort of protected because where I was so good as well that, you know, I was looked after and... Um, you know, they, they, you know, any new players come in from around the area, they knew that I would play them and, you know, win money for them. When did you turn pro, Jeremy, when you were 18? I turned pro when I was 18, yeah, when I come back from mm. Australia. And it was at 82, who was it you lost? It was Alex Higgins you lost? I lost to Higgins in 82 when he went on to win the World Championship. Mm. Probably the most famous clearance ever was against me. He had a 69 break, like the balls he potted were phenomenal. And... Um, he was the first person to bring a baby on telly. You know, when he, the first sportsman, yeah. they all do it now at mm -hmm. golf, but yeah. Higgins was the first one to do that. And make no mistake, anyone who knows anything about snooker, Alex Higgins made the game. You know, he made it, you know, he was exciting and um, he was a shot maker. Yeah, because you were 59 up and he cleared up with the 69. That's right. And you were only, how old then? 21, 22? I was 20, I think. Yeah. But... Uh, you know, another. I know. Okay, I'm 59 now. Still playing as good as ever. I still think I can win. Otherwise, I wouldn't be practicing. But I think if I'd have won it, then I would have probably killed myself because it was it was full on. You know, you know all of a sudden, like I'm a kid from two, and I'm I'm being I'm getting into nightclubs. You know, I'm getting girls looking at me twice. You know what I mean? They wouldn't give you another look. <laughs> I didn't know what I didn't know what was going on, and. Um, I sort of got carried away with it and um, I didn't win the World Champ. So, you know, there was always, there was always like a part of the year come like sort of January, February, where I pulled it all in and got ready for the World Championships. Where did you get that mentality like that? Was that because it's being surrounded by guys like Alex Higgins as well? Did you kind of adapt to that nature, the drinking, the kind of yeah, I zero fox given mentality. Yeah, I, it was. I come from the sort of reality of that snow crawl days that if you had money, you should be out partying. You know, the only reason you're not partying, or the only reason you didn't smoke because you had no money. You know, it was such a a stupid mindset in them days, but that was what it was. And then you know, you gambled, and you know, and being around Higgins, he was my hero. And the great thing with being after I lost that eighty two semi-finals to him I went on the road a lot with him so I'm practicing with my hero in the afternoon and in the night we're going and playing to five or six hundred people you know I was in my element you know I felt like that I was world champion but um you know if I had it again I would have definitely reined it in a bit for yeah sure. how was that did you ever have anyone to obviously you've got Alex Higgins one of the greatest of all time with his potting but was there ever anyone to say, look, Jimmy, you've got the world at your feet here, that you've, you've got so much potential to be the greatest of all time. Has anybody ever take your side to give you that talk at such a young age? Yeah, many, many people, you know, family members and uh, good people, you know, love me, you know, and I love them. But I was, I was fucking, excuse my friend, I was, I was a bad bastard. Because, <laughs> you know, I, I literally, during them world championships, after that as well, um, because we were in Sheffield for two weeks, you know, like I'd literally, I'd go to my room and then I'd sort of, I'd sneak out the hotel, go down the fire escape and then all of a sudden I'm in a nightclub drinking and there's people there over the other side who who just thought they put me to bed, you know, I was, you know, I, I'm listen, I'm not moaning, I had a fucking great time, but if 
you know, if I'd have done it properly, I'd have won plenty more. Who was it back then, drinking and smoking at the table? Well, you had Bill Wervenick, and the big Bill Wervenick, you wouldn't know him. He was... Um, I'll tell you how weird it was. In them days, he was allowed to have a tax reduction for drink. Now, can you imagine that, a sportsman? Because he had a nervous position where his hand shook, if he had so many drinks, so much alcohol, he stopped shaking. So he was allowed to have a tax reduction. So when you played Bill Worthing, he'd had eight, ten pints before you got there to play him, you know. So uh, it was strange times. Were you ever that pissed, Jimmy, before a game that you, you, you couldn't go out? No, well, a few exhibitions. <laughs> I'd, I'd, a few <laughs> exhibitions I'd gone and... Um, not realise I'd been there, you know, like I've been on the road and then all of a sudden I thought, well, OK, we're going to Glasgow tomorrow. And they go, well, we went there yesterday. And I'm like, well, I can't, you know, but you somehow you'd get through it. Like musicians, you know, you sort of, you get took away in the music, I'd get taken away in the snooker. But I never played um, stoned. I never played, I was always careful um, with my cocaine addiction. I was always careful that I never took cocaine while I was playing because... I think it was like four or five days to get out of your system and we used to get uh, urine tested. So I never wanted to get caught for that. And lucky enough, touch wood, I never, I always made sure that I was like a week clean before I played. So. Were they doing drug tests back then? All the time. A a absolutely everywhere. Every, every, I used to get tested. I used to know the doctor's first <laughs> names and everything. Because after you played a match... You, you you know you're drinking quite a bit of water during the match and all of a sudden someone tells you that you've got to go to the toilet it, you can be there an hour or so you know you can't go so no i i, I was regularly uh, tested for drugs yeah your first event you won the you were you not did you not need a snooker yes and you got it and you won that event that was another was that 17 each or 16 each no tw a 12 each 12 each 12 each with cliff Albert. Mm -hmm. and uh, yeah i needed a snooker see i think why the public like the way I play is because even to win that first tournament, I still had to get a snooker. I still had to win it the hard way because what I used to do, I used to go for so many shots. So it'd be like people who are watching, who are supporting you. They're on like a roller coaster, like a boxer swinging punches from everywhere. If one connects, he wins, but he's going to get a lot of uh, smacks in the, in the middle of it. So to win my first tournament, I should have won tournaments earlier than that but it took me you know i had to get a snooker as you said and i beat cliff forburn to win the mercantile credit but what i'm saying is the people who supported me went on that roller coaster ride of me going for the crazy shots what was that like winning your first tournament it was brilliant it was because it was so difficult because steve davis had got so much like a machine you know he was mm -hmm. um he was the ultimate professional you know in his he had a in his ho he had a hotel room to sleep and he had another one with his Space Invaders, you know, where he spent hours on there and then hours practising, you know, he was completely switched on, he was like a machine and then you've got me and Higgins like running around all over the place and people say to me now, who's the greatest player in the world? And I say, Ronnie O'Sullivan because I think what Ronnie O'Sullivan done, he took a bit of uh, Steve Davis's safety play a sort of a bit of my flair, a bit of um, Stephen Hendry's self-belief and bottle and built this machine. That's why he's such a, you know, such a great winner now, like the likes of Steve Davis, Stephen Hendry. Yeah, Ronald Sullivan's a legend in his own yeah, right, man. He's for that mindset and yeah. the, 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 his interviews in World is Hero Fox given mentality. That's why yeah. like, people love yourself. They yeah. love your Alex Higgins. They love your Ronald Sullivan. Yeah. Snooker never had use... Snooker wouldn't be as popular as it was. Snooker boomed in the 80s because yeah. of your Alex Higgins, yourself, come onto the scene. That, that. Everybody loves the bad boy, Jimmy. Yeah. Even though you're, you're, you're destroying your, your life for everybody else's yeah. kind of benefit, but people love that character because yeah. we're all fucking struggling and, and end up, and we just yeah, like to... Yeah, and I think they went on that, they'd gone on that ride mm -hmm. and then with, of going for the shots and then with Ronnie O'Sullivan, they got the full package. Mm -hmm. So after your first tournament, when when did you lose the world title? Is it eighty um, four? My first, yeah, that my first one was with um, my first final was with Steve Davis in eighty four, 
and uh, I didn't I absolutely didn't really care you know what I mean because I thought well I'll just win it next year because I was starting to really believe and my first session with him I went um, I went 12-4 down and really struggling with my tip and the late Jim Meadowcroft was a commentator at the time and I come off the table I said my tip's really hard he said look I'll put a new one on for you so we put a tip on at one o'clock in the morning in the crucible and we're actually practicing on the match table can you imagine that this day and age it's like people going out in Wimbledon and sorting their game out you know it's uh, incredible how we got access to it anyway the next morning um, I come out and I ended up I beat him. I, I beat him seven one. I went thirteen eleven down from twelve four down. I ended up losing eighteen sixteen. So you know that was a close one, the first one. And then after that, you had Dennis Taylor's great win against him the next year. And then it took me a few years to get to the final. Yeah, how was that, Jimmy? When you look at guys like Steve Davis, who look like the proper champion, the proper the role model kind of figure, the guy who's never out drunk, the guy who's never in the front papers to then, how much dedication did he have? Did you look at him and say, I need to work as hard as him or did you have that natural no, ability? I, 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 sorry to interrupt you, I had that natural ability but sometimes, you know, that's not enough mm -hmm. in any sport and I used to just think, well, I knew I was good enough, I knew I had the, the bottle but sometimes if you don't practice, if you don't practice your natural ability, um, you know, now and again it catches up with you and then it gets all a bit dark. But talk about Steve Davis now. He's a DJ. He's out of his nut every weekend. He's having the time of his life now, Steve Davis. <laughs> full circle. Full circle, you're yeah. calm down and he's I'm out fucking living down, it up. And, it, and he's like uh, giving it last. <laughs> did, you ever, did you ever think to yourself, though, going through those times that you could have, when you could have won everything because you never gave the dedication, that's why you always... Not always fail, but fail at the the last hurdle. Yeah, I think so. I think of, I think with my lifestyle as well. Like a couple of times, um, once I completely I completely um, run out of steam playing Stephen. I was fourteen eight up, and I'm trying to force the issue. And then before I knew where it was, it was like fourteen twelve, and then I'd gone. Then I'd completely like I had nothing at all. The pockets were getting smaller. The balls were getting bigger. And another time with him, I was 17 each and uh, I sort of twitched on the black. I sort of threw my cue at this black, an easy black, and I lost that one. They, they were my two biggest chances. And I think sometimes with sport, you, um, the balls don't forgive you, you know. And, um, you know, and he was such, you know, the Hendry was never beaten. He was always such in his own bubble you know fire alarms could be going off in the building and he'd still you know he had that mindset of strength but uh, yeah I regret I, reg I listen I say I regret I don't I don't really regret because I'm still playing if you ask me probably when I'm 80 when I'm finished no nah. when <laughs> I, when I'm like sort of uh, probably another five years of time I probably will really be angry with myself but I'm still competing now and uh, I'm playing as, actually as good as ever but unfortunately for me the standard is it's risen and everyone is so good at so many parts of the game mm -hmm. and you've got all these Chinese players coming through now we've had Ding but he doesn't really he's not really made it yet but there's loads of others coming well, you, you always give the Chinese players credit they always do amazing but they don't seem to last the pace they don't win mm. many events no they're good at potting they're good at everything else but do you think that comes down to the the grip within i don't i don't know i think they have a strange mindset see i i could be playing a chinese lad in a match and he'd miss a certain shot and the next day he'd go and play that shot 50 times and he thinks he's mastered it but it's not he's in the heat of the battle it's the different mindset isn't it yeah he's like a golfer you know he's gonna he's gonna get most easy chips onto the green, but when it's all that pressure on it, you know. So I think their mindset's not quite right yet, but I think the new lot are coming through are sort of a bit more like Mark Selby. They've sort of got the whole package. Yeah. What What was your preparation for the two weeks at the Crucible, Jimmy, compared to your Steve Davises, your John Parrots and stuff like that? Um, not good, not good. I must confess, not good. I, I'd win my first match and you'd have like, um, after your first round, you'd have four or five days off. So we'd always have a party. That sort of, 
sort of um you know it was silly really because you know you you had the whole year to party but i don't know it's like it's my sort of um i don't know where i come from you just sort of felt and and people in sheffield are so friendly as well you know and uh I don't know, we used to win the first match, go on the piss and sort of like rest for a couple of days and then go and play your next match and hopefully then stay deep in the tournament. So basically, you know, if any sort of... Nowadays, as you know yourself, like footballers and all that, you know, I used to see footballers out on a Thursday night paralytic. You know, <laughs> you wouldn't like dream of something like that now, you know. I met the great George Best. Legend. And... Um, <clears throat> I'll tell you this story, it's like fantastic, it's uh, unbelievable. I'm completely wired, paralytic, out of my nut. And I'm in the, it was called the Grecian Grill in London. Many people would know it, it was sort of a, like a restaurant that you could drink all night in. And uh, George Best is there with his friend. And I'm, um, as I said, out of my nut. And I've seen him and I've gone, George, and I've gone over to him. And I drove him mad. Do you remember when he took the ball off of Gordon Banks and headed it and scored? Yeah. Well, I have fucking drove him fucking mad to where his miners have gone, look, Jimmy, you'll have to leave him alone. I don't know this at the time. My mates tell me this the next day. I'm like, oh, no, he's my fucking hero. What have I done that for? Anyway, lo and behold, about two years later, I see him in another place and he's paralytic and he's drove me mad about the black that I missed against Stephen Hendry. Completely, like, pestered me, you know, drove me mad. But I'm forgiving him because of what I'd done to him. And then I seen him about ten years later, and we talked about the first two times we met and had a good laugh. That's two legends in their own right. That was brilliant. Why, again, that's why people love you as guys like Jimmy White, your Jersey Best, even though he's were kind of rebels. He's kind of zero fucks but giving. I think somebody asked George Best as well that, how does it feel that your life's slipping? He's like, slipping. He says, I've just been with two Miss Worlds. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, 50 grand on the, on the bed. But I think George Best, um, I've only met him three times for moments, but I know, you know, he never hurt anybody else, only himself. You know, I've never caused any grief to anyone. Do you know what I mean? All the, I, I, listen, I've broke people's hearts by not winning as much as I should, but... You know, in general, I, I've only done the damage to myself, really. How was it getting thrown into the limelight as well? Because it was kind of rock star mentality. The snooker players were becoming mega stars. Yeah. With all the TV and the money that was involved as well. I think it was like 100 grand for a 147, yeah. I think you won at one point. Yeah. Um, how was that being through into the limelight? I, I've just... Uh, um, Louis Farouk just done a programme called Gods of Snooker. And I've just reconnected with an old manager of mine, Harvey Lisberg, who owned Kennedy Street Enterprise. He used to have rock stars. And he took me on when I was 20, and he had my teeth done and my hair permed. And every, and we literally, like, you know, I got carried away with it, you know what I mean? Because you do think you're famous, which is an absolute load of bollocks, as you know, because yeah. you're more famous than me. No you know? chance. Yeah, you are, big time. You are. And for sure, what happened to me was that... Because you're in people's front rooms like three or four times a year for like two weeks at a time, people sort of think you know you. And in them days, there was only four channels, you know. So, it, you know, it, it becomes sort of, um, you know, you was famous. You know, girls would like talking to you, wouldn't give you a second look. You know, uh, you was getting roped off in nightclubs. You wasn't paying for drinks. It, it was crazy. And I did get... You know, carried away with it and took full advantage. <laughs> <laughs> so would I, Jimmy. So would I. I bet you do. <laughs> Not as much now, but fuck me. Like, I don't think I would have made the 80s. If I was flying high in the 80s, I don't think as it. No, I'm the very cocaine lucky. was popping, like you say, four channels, 15, 20 million people watching yeah. stuff at that time. And you tend to see a lot of the celebrities in the 80s, early 90s have ended up fucking overdosing or yeah. whatever because it's so extreme like yeah. the pressure of that life must have been so intense mm. like fuck me like the 80s especially with your persona especially being with Alex Higgins like yeah. the pressure that you two must have had did that the, the alcohol and the drugs kind of block that out Jimmy? Well for me I was never really a, a massive you know coke was not my thing at all you know what I mean I was a big drinker I come from uh, you know a drinking family and um 
you know, it, I, I was like, I could really like, even at like 20, I could drink all night, you know. And then all of a sudden I found cocaine. And then all of a sudden we'd be in one place, the cocaine would arrive. I'd have the cocaine and we'd go to the next place as though we'd just gone out for the night. We'd been out for like five or six hours and then all of a sudden we could start again, you know. So that was a terrible thing for me, finding cocaine. And then all of a sudden cocaine becomes more than the drinking and then, you know, it uh, you're up for days on it, you know, just sitting there talking bollocks. Yeah, that's the same. When I was, <coughs> I never took coke unless I was drinking. So, yeah, yeah. And cool. uh, like, obviously get that... I only took it because it gave me that extra couple of days, Jimmy. I yeah. didn't want to sober up. No. So it, I means I could just drink more. Yeah. We're still trying to keep sane, even yeah. though it was driving me fucking insane. Yeah. No, yes, like, right. it's, it's crazy. Because like, you, you're very open about being on crack as well. When, was that 84, Jimmy? I tell you what, I, I, I don't... I was on it for about... Three uh, months? Yeah, three months. I had 30 grand in a bank, right? In a, like, one of them, um, like, hidden accounts I had. And uh, I started smoking it. And uh, now and again, I'd put it in a, a joint, you know, on top of a bit of weed, which would, like, completely just send you all over the place. It was an absolute waste of time. And then I started smoking it, and then it becomes sort of a secret thing. And then before you know where you are, you're doing it sort of, you know, two or three times a week, you know, and then you, you do, like, 1,500 quid, two grand, and, you know, and you just... And the, the, the most... Fabulous people in the world who I dearly love still to this day. You know, see that like a little bit of the crack would drop on the floor and you see them put their foot on it and they're moving it away. So, and, and, where they, and they're going, oh, well, I don't know where there is. And you know he's fucking lying. Do you know what I mean? That's how bad that drug was. And I, I called it sucking the devil's dick. And I'd done it for three months. And luckily for me... Um, I'd done the 30 grand and I think I went on holiday just after and I was lucky enough I sort of got myself together and I'd never do that again. Yeah. Do you wish you'd have kicked the coke as well at that time, especially coming off that and it would have maybe gave you more focus into your ability of being one of the greatest of all time? Yeah, I would have done. Yeah, I would have, you know, the cocaine sort of, at that time as well, though, it was absolutely everywhere, you know. The, the people who have this coke now, it's just garbage. You know what I mean? It's just so, it's so, you know, it's even a waste of time. But in them days, it was um, coming from the street as well. I knew where to get the good stuff and all that, and I knew how to meet the drug dealers, and, you know, I, I sort of knew my way around it. But uh, for me, it was a bit like yourself. It gave me that extra day or two days to carry on drinking. I'd never take cocaine without drink. Yeah, it's no. a fucked up drug as well. Yeah. Was that... See going through the 80s and that as well, Jimmy, like, what was the height of your, your most damage? Um, did you ever well, look yourself in the mirror and go, fuck me, I oh need no. to change? Oh, or no. did you think you were okay? No, I was fucked. I was fucked a few times. I was like, you know, uh, it, it, thinking about it now sort of gives me a bit of anxiety. But um, I sort of, I hid it well as well from people. You know, there's a lot of people who had no idea I was on it. Well, I thought they had no idea I was on it. But... Um, no, there was a few dark times where, like, you know, you'd wake up after a couple of days and you didn't want, you know, you sort of wanted to just go back to bed or just hide because you, you, you was going, there was so much grief that you had to face that you'd caused. So, uh, no, there was a lot of dark times. So the 90s, five world championships in a row, like 90, 91, 92, 93, 94, is that correct? Um yeah, I, I think I, I lo my last one was um, when I was 14, 8 up, I think, with Hendry. I'm yeah. not sure. But with John Parrott, um, <clears throat> I went 7 0 down with him. He played phenomenal the first session. But I, wasn't, I didn't think I was going to lose that. I was a little bit overconfident. And then all of a sudden, I'm 7 0 down. I end up losing 18 12 or something. Um, and then I think I lost 4 to Stephen. And, you know, Stephen, he was just so at home at the World Championships, you know, he, he sort of, he always fancied winning, you know. Yeah, how, what, how, so how was your mindset then? Because to get to five finals with the calibre of people, the calibre of players back then, Jimmy, yeah. how were you, did you stop drinking? Did you stop taking gear? Sometimes, sometimes I'd stop for a few months and get ready for the World Championships, but I never stopped long enough, you know, I never... I never give myself um, a full chance of 
you know, being prepared for everything. But no excuses, you know. He beat he beat me fair and square. Twice I should have beaten him. And uh, probably with Davis in 84. But no, I didn't give myself um, enough time because a snooker player... Now, a snooker player is on full alert all the time. You are, it's like a golfer. You're always... It, the more you're winning, the more you're practising because the more you're trying to improve that sort of confidence feeling. And in... In them days, it was just like, I'll, I'll just practice five weeks before the World Championships. I'll be fine. And most of the time I was. But to have been like, to win like Stephen won and Steve Davis and that, you had to play five, six hours a day, six days a week, all year round. What were you practising? What do you mean? Every day. Were you practising a few hours here and there? Or were you yeah, taking no, days just, off? Yeah, I, let, I take weeks off. For fuck's know. sake, oh, Jimmy. Fucking, oh, See, no, when you look no, back no. at it... Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> See, when you look back at it with that period of starting off in the 80s, mm. 82, winning your first title, then yeah. going through five finals, if you'd concentrate more and what like Henry's, yeah. Davis, how many events, do you, how many championships do you think you'd have won? Well, um, I can't really say because yeah. I'm not finished yet. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But we'll have to do this one again when I finish because um, I'd I'd have won a lot more and I'd have and I'd have, and the ones that I'd won I'd have enjoyed it because a lot of times you win you, you're you're winning on instinct you're not winning in control okay that's great but it's more of a a roller coaster you know so you win and lose that way sometimes it's nice to be in full control and if the other guy beats you you just shake his hand but when you're sort of playing on instinct sometimes it's a roller coaster and you just sort of completely go flat after win or lose because mm -hmm. you know you just finished the race your fans going through the years have been so loyal to you like, I think when you were losing like your fourth final fifth final they were upset broken hearted more than yourself why do you think that is uh, well you know as I said they went on the roller coaster ride with me and you know I got to know if you go into these venues um, every year and all that I wasn't one of these people who go out the stage door and hide and all that you know my dad was always amongst the crowd you know having uh drinks with them and all that so i'd i'd meet them and got to know a few people and you know there was a couple of times when we had to console like people you know big giant of men who were just like so upset that i lost but you know that's sport how was it with the one with stephen hendry and you've got that chance to clear up you must have read how much does that play in your mind all the time um when that, the shot comes up all the time. Yeah, every so event, I think it gets every shows. Every time, you know, and I'm like, Ugh. But um, no, I just, you know, that's part of the game. See, this game of snooker is, you know, if you don't give absolutely everything to every shot, you can uh, you can miss anything. And if you don't, it might, it might not be that shot, it might not be the shot after the shot, but eventually because you haven't given it 100%, it would catch up with you. either lose a positional shot or you'd miss a pot. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the winners and the top players is because they go through the torment of the game, good and bad. You know, they, you know, they have to give it 100%. But for any snooker player up and coming, like to be in six finals, would still, they would bite your arm off to just even be competing at six finals. They obviously never won, but mm. it's still a phenomenal career. Like, yeah. even though you've never had that final cherry on the cake but yeah. you've probably more loved and more respected oh, I even know Stephen Henry's a, a legend in his own right but people would kind of sway towards yourself yeah. than Stephen Henry even though the ability he had the, the robotic kind of nothing seemed to phase him did no. that annoy you? not really because I was quite I, I was very proud of him Stephen Henry because he went to Alex Higgins' funeral mm -hmm. and not a lot of people went to his funeral why? Why did he go? Or why did they not go? I don't know, because I don't know, maybe, I don't know that you'd have to ask them that, you know, but like a top, you know, sportsman like that mm. in our small environment of snooker, I thought everyone should have been there, but that's another story. But he went, and the reason he went is because when he was up and coming, me and Higgins used to practice with him, you know, and when he was like 13 and 14, I would give his, I always give people the greatest of advice and do the opposite, you know, and uh, we knew that he was going to be good, Stephen, and you know, I told him to do the right things. And if you want to win, you've got to practice. And then before I knew where it was, he was uh, right on my coattails. Yeah, phenomenal player. Great player. Yeah, in 95, you were uh, diagnosed with uh, bowel cancer. 
How was that going through that experience, especially um, after losing your last final and then and then that happened, Jimmy? Yeah, I'm not sure what year that was. Um, it's quite a long time ago. I um, I went, I come home from somewhere and uh, I felt this lump. And we've done this campaign for testicle cancer a few times, you know. Men, especially young lads of 18 and 19, they might feel a lump and they think, well, you know, that's fuck all that a go in a few weeks or whatever, you know what I mean? And it doesn't, it either gets harder. And um, so anyone who feels any sort of abnormality lumps down down by your testicles, you've got to go and get it checked out. Lucky for me, I went to see my doctor as soon as I felt it. And he said, I don't like that. He sent me to a specialist and then I had the operation and I had it taken out, and it was the type of cancer I had that if I wouldn't have got it checked out and it had gone anywhere else, I wouldn't be here today. So I was very, very lucky. So if anyone feels any abnormality down there, you must get it checked out. How much does that make you reevaluate your life, Jimmy? Uh, well, it happens so quick, do you know what I mean? And it's like being my age and, um, you know, I've lost lots of powers through different things in life and all that, and it... You know, you know yourself, you've lived your life, you've got to enjoy, you know, your every day if you can. Yeah. Were you still drinking after that? Just thinking, does that make you want to kind of live a fresh life in case anything else happens? Or do you just go the fuck it button as well and just go full steam Yeah, you ahead? can go two ways with that. Yeah. You know, I thought, you know, there was both, a bit of both sides. But I have seven grandchildren now, you know, and uh, they're my whole life, you know, like um, it's to see my kids with their kids you know just uh fulfills me in every every you know every part of my being it's just like i'm just so fucking lucky yeah that, that gives me the will to keep you've going. got five of your own kids jimmy pardon five five of your own kids yeah i've got five kids two is it two of your oldest daughters two yeah. oldest daughters as well no i've got four daughters four and one daughters son. yeah because i've watched an interview with two of yeah. your daughters and yeah. um they were said, just with the travelling and that, how hectic was that, Jimmy, to be away from your family and kids all the time? And Yeah, that was, it, it was hard. It was hard, but at the same time, we're doing something we loved and they're all going, they're getting the best of private schools and, you know, we're you know, having a nice life from where I come from. And even though I come from a, a loving household, but, you know, what, what you don't have, you don't miss. And, you know, with my kids... I tried to do the best I can, man. Yeah. After the cancer as well, your mum and brother died in the same years, yeah, I correct, Jimmy? Yeah, my, my brother died of um, lung cancer and then my mum sort of died four or five months later, more yeah. or less of a broken heart. So to hear she that. was ill, yeah. It, that was a terrible time for us. Did that affect you as well? Yeah, that your fucked snooker? us all up, yeah. That was, that was bad, yeah. It snooker sort of, everything sort of took, you know, you... you when something like that happens to you, in a, as a family as well, very close to my sister and my other two brothers, you sort of, um, you become completely punchy. You know, you're doing things that you have to do, but you're sort of, like anyone in life, when they lose people close to them like that. Yeah, it's difficult. Mm. When I used to lose people that like, I hid behind the drink and the drugs, yeah. because I couldn't handle the pain. Yeah. I was too soft. I didn't yeah. want to speak to anybody. People used to ask, are you fine? I used to say, yeah, yeah. yeah. I wasn't. I just sitting in my room fucking drinking and snorting gear, yeah. Yeah. But because I couldn't handle heartache no i just felt consistent in my life like there was constant pain and misery i didn't know how to handle it wow. so i had behind all the external stuff the how long have you been clean three years oh, well three done. years in september well done yeah well, thank you brother good well done and I, my life's amazing but i, I still battle jimmy there's still more problems now like yeah it's fucked up like yeah people yeah. say you must be doing you must be feeling great i feel the fucking same yeah. like, i still feel as if there's a war zone going up yeah, here yeah, but i just course. i just don't act on it by doing bad stuff i just no. accept that there's a war zone up here yeah. and try and keep because i've got two kids um yeah had two girls pregnant at the same time and i was never really for the first few years i wasn't always there i used to buy them stuff and yeah uh, pass them on to my mom and my yeah. my um my sister and pretend that i was a great dad yeah obviously now the last like three four years i've been trying to work on myself i feel like a proper father good for it's you it took me a long fucking time it's the though. greatest feeling yeah. in the world and listen it's all about it's all about working on yourself all the time you know mm -hmm. what i mean like do you go meetings and that yeah ga meetings yeah good. i went to the g, g yeah. gambling was the one no i fucked everything really? yeah <laughs> <laughs> no yeah. how long we got 
Are you really? Yeah, was you, you, was you gambling? Gambler. I gam- I've been gambling since I was age of four, five, six, as young as I can remember. We used to go to a place called nah. Largs. Yeah. Away up, up in Scotland, like it's like a seaside resort. Yeah. But my aunties used to play like fruit machines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you had like a thing, you used to put 10 pence in, it was like horses. Yeah. It was like little computer. Yeah, yeah, ones. yeah. Started from then, and then there was a thing called Chippy at school. Used yeah. to throw the coins up at the wall and yeah, yeah, flick yeah. them up, heads or tails. Yeah. And my dad took me to a place called Shawfield at seven or eight, which was a dog track. Yeah. So I've been gambling in wow. my mind. And then wow. for fucking 30 odd years, Jimmy, like, wow. I fucked everything. Man. Lying, stealing, cheating. A compulsive, gamb- a compulsive gambler is a compulsive liar. Ah, oh, the worst. Yeah. Well, See, gambling, in a way, is worse than drugs or drink. Because you can hide that. Yeah, but you can also, uh, you can also, like, you can't, you can't get out of sometimes when you're gambling. See, the wicked thing you've got now in this world, 10 years, say 15, 20 years ago, you had all the kids that uh, going away to college playing poker online. So all of a sudden they, they leave college after two or three years and their mum and dads have got a credit card bill, you know, 20, 30 grand when they lost, bingo in general. Where the wives are getting the husbands, um, getting the kids to school, the husband goes off to work and then they're sitting in front of the computer all day playing bingo and all of a sudden, like, a year's down the line, they, uh, they owe 30, 40 yeah. grand. My gambling, I used to, I used to go to the, to, I used to play snooker in the afternoon, get money, go to the dogs at night. Now, if I won at the dogs, I'd go to the casinos. And if I had a miracle and won at the casinos, I'd go to a private card game, right? <laughs> what fucking chance did I have? <laughs> and then all of a sudden, I was trying to play snooker in the middle of all that you know as, as well as the drinking and the and the drugs but the gambling is it's the most I, i've seen people i've seen people borrow a fiver who've got 995 pound on them so that they can have a thousand pound bet instead of a 995 pound bet yeah. how sick yeah. is that Jimmy, I've done so many bad things in the past wow. to get money to yeah. feed the addiction. I could spend two or three grand in the bookies, yeah, and then my car would break down with fuel, yeah. Oh, wow, because I never put I, oh, no, like, that's sick. You I would, would probably grand, sick. two grand on a dog wow. back in the day when they never used to phone up and register and say, Look, somebody's putting a big bet on you. Could put fucking all sorts yeah. on back in the day, and it would, I wouldn't keep 20 pound buy or 100 pound buy for no. food before you know what. That's why I'm still good at these interviews as yeah. well because I've got a gift with people. Yeah. Because I'd fuck so much yeah, money. Of course. If I was coming to tap your money, Jimmy, yeah. I would make you feel so good before I'd left. Yeah. I was going to say, look, going to give me a couple hundred quid. Yeah. You knew you weren't getting that money back. Yeah. But because I'd buttered you up so yeah. much, you would end up going, I'll kill you, cunt. Yeah. And yeah. giving me the wow. fucking money. Wow. So I've kind of got that. Yeah. Nah. Mentality. Yeah, because you because your addiction, you wanted the money. Yeah. At, I know at any cost. Get, yeah. Yeah. At anybody. Yeah. Your bet. Your you borrow your mum's mm-hmm. rent. Yeah. Did you, do you not gamble at all no, now? No, um, gambling was the first thing it went. That was me four years off gambling. Then the drinks, drinking drugs was after that. Everything was kind of, I kind of, I stopped the cocaine. Yeah. And then I ended up on the weed. Yeah. So I replaced one thing with another yeah. while the gambling was there. Yeah. I think, no, I don't think the weed is the worst drug mm. in the world. Not the skunk. I think the dirt weed, you know, every mm. now and again don't hurt because it changes your mood, but it leads to other but every things. every moderation, Jimmy, if I have one joint. Yeah. I'm 20 joints deep. Right, okay. Because then it starts coming into the more. I'm lazy anyway. Yeah. So while if I smoke weed, I'm just fucking lazy. Yeah, yeah. Because people can still be active on weed, <laughs> but I just, I can't, only thing I battle with now is my eating. Yeah. Sugar. Yeah. That's the only thing I've not mastered. I'm okay. An, an emotional eater. Yeah. So because we get so many comments and fucking. Oh, you don't take the notes of them you, mugs, you do just, you? No, no, but you, you just constantly eating on the road, eating. Yeah, so yeah, of course. Yeah. You just, everything's just outside noise. Yeah. So I'm trying to cut away everything that, Good. Kind of deflates me. Yeah. But I'm fucking human as well. I make mistakes. Absolutely, of course. But you know, you, you're, how old are you? 37. Yeah, you listen, you've got your whole life, mm-hmm. you know, and you you must never have another bet, ever. Oh, Even can't. if you know yeah. that you can't lose. Because mm-hmm. sometimes you know you can't lose, right? Things can't get beat, right? But you, in your case, you should know. It's like Ronnie Wood. He's been sober now. 12, 13 years. But he's exactly the same as when he was um, drinking and fucking about. Because he was always active. He was always painting or doing music stuff. You know, but... So it did, it, it sort of... He stopped, but he has, he's, he's exactly the same character. It's, it's amazing. Mm-hmm. But obviously, there was a dark side 
with him, you know, that you don't see, you know, and like the thing. But you're the gambling. You know, you, you you've done well to to get out of the gambling yeah. because without owing everything, I did at the start, but then because you you try and gamble your way out of it, of course, and you just fucking digging a deep one, the and chase, you're, you're pawning the way, like you're pawning kids stuff, and I knew everybody oh. in the pawn shop. <laughs> <laughs> they knew my name and uh, oh, no. I used to get extra money off them. Just to have a bet? Yeah, just to fucking So you have can't a bet. sleep then. If you've got money, you've got to be gambling. Yeah, oh, well. because it was that buzz they call yeah. it a chemical yeah, imbalance course, yeah, where yeah. the dopamine levels are through yeah. the roof. Yeah. So once I've not got that bet on, my life feels terrible. Yeah. I feel depressed. Yeah, I feel yeah, tired. Yeah. So, so you must have won occasionally. Oh, yeah, yeah. But that just went straight back on. No, what, quicker? Yeah, bigger bets. Yeah, man. Yeah, it doesn't mean fuck all. Listen, in, in lockdown as well, um, People have done so much money online gambling, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's pretty scary. Yeah, depression's went through the roof, uh, yeah. alcohol abuse, drug abuse, gambling, yeah. everything's went through the roof because people were animals at the end of the day, Jimmy. Yeah, we course. are warriors, we're hunters, we should yeah. be out into nature, we don't, yeah. we're just stuck. That's why I feel sorry for the kids now with this generation. Yeah. They're just fucking sitting on iPads, Jimmy. Yeah, no, no, you, you go in a restaurant and there's like, they're, they're, everyone's on their fucking phone. It's me as well, I'm yeah. 10 hours a day on my phone, Jimmy. Yeah. Well, yeah, but that's your business, though, isn't it? I use that as an excuse. Mm. Should I really be using sitting well, ten hours a day in my I phone? I think when you're with your kids, if I'm with my grandkids mm -hmm. and that, I sort of give them a dirty look, you know, put your phone down, you know. Yeah. You know what I mean? You're with me. I don't see you enough. You know? What was your height of your gambling as well, Jimmy? Was oh, that my? Because um, you've been poker player. You've been. Um, yeah, I won the poker million. Yeah, I've seen that. So I, I can I can play poker, but I can't really play poker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I um, I had. My biggest bet, I had 20 grand on a horse um, called Vodkatini in Sandown Races. It never even got out the fucking stores. It stayed in the stores. <laughs> um, no, I, I was a big, mad mug, mug punter gambler. But uh, it's, it's, it's a bit of ego as well, gambling. You know, you feel a bit tricky. You know, you feel like sort of, uh, you know what you're doing, especially if you're winning and all mm. that. You know what I mean? Which is... But gambling's... For people, um, if they do it for a bit of fun, like, uh, you know, if they have, like, a 20-quid accumulator on the football once a week, I don't think that's bad. But when they get like me and you, when yeah. they're sick and they do anything to get money, I was the same. I'd be going to one bank manager, uh, talking to him about my overdraft, and he'd be going, OK, and I'd be sort of giving it to another bank manager to keep him sweet, and then, like... And all that, all the time I was gambling. Did everybody see this, Jimmy? Or, uh, when you were going through your drink, your drugs, your gambling, women eyes and all the bullshit of the day, did yeah. people see it or were they too scared to tell you? Or, or did I, you hide it well? I, I, I hid it well, but, I, you know, I wouldn't listen to anyone, you know what I mean? I was mm. Once you're sort of an adult, you, I was doing my own damage. It was up to me, you know. And you've seen your good friend Alex Higgins as well. When mm. you've seen him slipping with the alcohol, it, did you ever look at him, Jimmy, and say, this is the way my life's going as well? No. I didn't. But the problem with Higgins is he was a gambler. He was he was a jockey before he was a snooker player. So he was always horses all day long. And but he never looked after himself at all. You know, um, he, he died of malnutrition in the end. And me and his sister done what we can for him. And uh, you know, he was the type of person that if he had a say we went out for a Chinese meal and he'd ate plenty, he'd be talking about it for a couple of days because he didn't eat. It was on like he ate like a pigeon. So. He didn't look after himself, but the gambling, the gambling really got hold of him because he beat throat cancer. But because he had no money, obviously the depression set in and uh, he didn't look after himself. How was that when he passed in 2010? Evil, you know, evil. I was his real mate at snooker, you know, he was my hero. Um, you know, he, he could be, you know, he could be obnoxious and... Um, but there was a nice side to him as well, which I see a very sweet side where he'd be the kindest person in the world. But he could also, you know, he could cause a, a fight in a lift. You know, he was fucking nuts. That's God rest they, him. That's where they drank and stuff as well, yeah. though, it? Like mm. everything. When Ronnie O'Sullivan came on the ranks, what were you thinking then? And you're still trying to win a world title and you've seen oh. this animal come on the snooker table. Well, I played him. In, in them days, you had to go to Blackpool and you had to qualify for about two months and then they picked I think eight players out of about 200 who'd won the most matches uh, to become professional and he'd won 56 matches out of 57 obviously I'd heard about this kid 
through this, you know, people saying about him. And anyway, when I see him, um, he beat me 5-1 in the tournament. But I should have actually, looking back now, that should have been my eye opener. Like, right, I've got to stop everything if I want to compete. Because now the new generation was coming through, the John Higginses, the Mark Williams, Ronnie O'Sullivan. And uh, I said that day, you know, it was like a breath of fresh air. That's just what snooker needed because, you know, Hig um, Ronnie O'Sullivan, uh, John Higgins yesterday, first first match yesterday of the new season, first shot, he had a 147. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's like phenomenal. You know, they're the class of 92 and they're still going strong. Yeah, why do you think that? Is your Higgins and your Williams and that can still turn it on at a big I, I tournament? I think they're just such great players and they had the likes of Steve Davis, me, Stephen Hendry, all these great players to, you know, to sort of pick bits from all of them. And, uh, you know, that's why they're so, their they're craft of their sport, they're so good at every part of the game now. Yeah, because they've got a shot and they've got a shot and they've got, they've yeah. got so many different shots in their locker. That, yeah. And their safety play, Higgins' safety play is one oh, of phenomenal. the best ever. Yeah, oh, it's brilliant. But it's, it, and I was talking to him yesterday and he'd lost... Uh, he lost two and a half stone, you know, he's like phenomenal. Do you think that goes a long way as well when you're thinking and feeling better going into a game? Any sport, anything, if you're fit, um, you know, you've got clear mm -hmm. foot. There's when you talk about Ray Weird and what a great player. He was a policeman before he was a snooker player, you know, so you have to think on your feet, you know. So in situations, you know, and he was fairly fit as well, you know, your clear mind. What's your greatest game you've ever been involved in, Jimmy? My greatest game I ever been involved in, which I won, was I beat Parrot in the UK Championship. It was like one each, two each, right up to fourteen each, and then I won seventeen fourteen. So that was my greatest victory today. Is there any players you've ever played with that never quite made it, and you thought they were going to get, be a player? Yeah, well, there was this David Gray. I spoke about him. Unfortunately for him, he he didn't carry on. He won one ranking tournament. He beat Mark Selby in the final. Um, there was another kid called Steve James who had all the talent in the world and sort of didn't progress, no. Yeah, sad, isn't it? It is sad, you know, you see him and you think, for fuck's sake, you know, why didn't you become dedicated? But sometimes, you know, Tony Mio, who was my partner, he was very successful, but he hated being away from home. See, some people are different, aren't they? Yeah. Snickers changed over the last 10, 20 years. It's kind of evolved as well with... Sky Sports kind of things, and you've got tournaments. What every nearly every week, Jimmy? Yeah. How, how many tournaments are you playing a year There's just now? Twenty eight a year now. And when I was at my peak, there were six. So you know you'd have. There's no time really to switch off, but it's also it's great because you know for these new snooker players coming through, there's loads of money to win. Mm -hmm. There's loads of countries to travel and you know enjoy your life and uh, pick up other cultures and all that so for a young snooker player now it's a great time barry Ernst done a great job yeah he's done amazing he's done amazing for darts and that as yeah, well yeah like, darts yeah in Friday. fucking madness see when you got what was your 147 in the world championship what, what when you won the 100 grand who was that against oh it was against tony drago you got a thousand pound a point so i won a hundred and forty seven thousand <laughs> And I won 14,000 for the highest break. So I got 161,000. Plus, I got to the final and I got 90,000 for getting to the final. And Stephen Hendry beat me and he got, altogether, he got 200,000 and I got 260,000. <laughs> and like you, I set fire to it. <laughs> <laughs> As you do, me. I'm just glad I didn't. I wasn't born oh, there. Mate, I mean, tell you what, though. Did it? I tell you. I tell you a good bit of therapy for you, mm -hmm. right? You might find this a bit strange. Your GA people might think it's not. It ain't a bad thing to go and sit in a betting shop now and again. Mm -hmm. It's not bad. You know what I mean? I know you get all the. You know, I could saying that I couldn't be around cocaine or anything. You know what I mean? Or yeah. like people are drinking and they keep telling you the same fucking joke. But <laughs> with betting shops, with gambling. You never hear someone tell you when they won. They never go, well, but it's all about, ah, oh, fucking, that, the, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's a, the mindset is very strange. Gambling's a fucking it's it's a crazy. bastard addiction. Like, it's, it's the crazy. hidden addiction, I call it. Yeah. Um, it's just so many people have got so many problems. We just, yeah, I, I was just too proud to 
get help. I don't want I anybody it, getting it, it, help. I, I, I shouldn't be laughing, really, because there's a lot of people. It's a very sad situation. You know, I've set fire to... But make no mistake, I gambled at least three million quid. So if I gambled three million quid, you know, I'd probably have to earn six or seven to get that. Do you know what I mean? So that's a lump. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's fucking retirement money. You know what I mean? So I should be more sick with that. But because it was at the time it was going so quick, you don't fucking think, do you? Do you think you'd been you'd have been as popular though if you never done all that shit? No, probably not. No, probably not. No, I I like to think my popularity was from a sort of my going for my shots as well. You know, and not really sort of screaming too much when I lost. What's your What's your worst day have been when you realised that you needed ch to change? That you needed help. Um, well, I went bankrupt through gambling. Um, you know, um, I sort of like my game was completely gone. But deep down in my in my heart, I knew that I could get my game back together. That wasn't the problem. The problem was that when you have to sort of, okay, take a grip and uh, like take sort of stack of what's going on. And um, I don't know when that was, but it, it took me a couple of years. But I've been, I've had sort of a good time now for the last 15 years or so. I've had like a good life, you know. Mm -hmm. I've enjoyed myself. That's the thing with Jimmy, when you start changing, you kind of grow a conscience as well. And that's yeah. the, the bad part about mm. becoming clean and trying to become as open and as honest. You yeah. think about all the misery you've caused. Ooh. You think about all the regret that you could have achieved. I played professional football when I was younger and I had everything at my feet. Yeah. And I fucked it, man. It's wow. just, I was too scared to take the risk. I never believed in myself either. I right. never had the belief, the self-belief that I have now yeah. that I'm going to, I know I'm going to achieve so something massive. Not, so if you'd have had good advice, it could have all been different as well. Yeah. But you're doing all right. Yeah, I'm doing, it? listen, life's right. amazing now. Do you yeah. know what I mean? My football career would have been over now. So yeah, yeah. Just, now you're flying. Yeah, I'm just fucking and flying. And I'm fucking 59 and I can't wait to practice. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. But you're looking great, man. Yeah. You're looking great. I've seen I you in vid, fil, films, uh, Games in the 80s, and, I've, and you, look if, you look as if you're at fucking death's door, Jimmy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, my, <laughs> my eyes were like piss holes in the snow, <laughs> and that's with makeup on. Yeah. Was it, um, what was your best era? What was your best year in snooker you had? Um, I think I've got, I think I've got times coming now, you know, I'm in such a good place now mentally. You see, my problem is, I'm playing as good as ever, right? It's not like boxing or football, you can carry on as long mm -hmm. as your eyes are okay, and you've got the passion to practice. But I could be playing in a match, and I'll, I'll be in the balls and everything's going perfect. And I think, did I water the plants? And then my other side of my brain is going, well, what fucking difference does that make now where you are? You know, focus on what you're doing. So I think I've got it, I've got it to come. You know, I, I truly believe that I've got winning tournaments to come. That's a great feeling to have, yeah. though. No, it's huge. But you've always been a winner. You've always won tournaments. I've won, yeah, but I mean, not as, not, not as like, you know, when you've been in six finals and all that, it's a nearly man and all that, that doesn't eat away at me because I just want to compete, you know. Like that youngster I played yesterday, I know he knows who I am because I've played him in exhibition in Ireland, but he was strutting around yesterday, didn't for a minute think he was going to get beat, do you know what I mean? And so that's nice to sort of win them type of matches. How do you get into a world championships now? How many qualifiers would you need to play? I have to play four to get there. And that's against... And against all the top players. Top 100 players? Yeah, top 128, right down to 16. And you're at 100 just now? No, about 82. That's all right, Jimmy. Yeah, not bad, not not bad. What's no. the, the highest ranking player that's ever won a tournament? Oh, um, oh, World Championships, I think uh, there was someone who was outside the top 32 has won it. Yeah? So, yeah. You, you so one event, you need to win one semi-final to move your rank down yeah, again? Oh, yeah, absolutely. No, no, I've got good I've got good times ahead. You'll have to come and interview me when we've won. Yeah, that's listen, that, you've already got a film to your name, but yeah. imagine winning a world title. Like, yeah. That would be unbelievable. I, Anything's I, po listen, anything is possible. Uh, listen, I, I wouldn't sit here and say to you that I had any chance or to anyone else if I didn't think. I didn't have a chance. I'd go and play fucking bad golf in Spain, you know. So mm. I do truly believe I can win. When you started getting into more the TV side of things as well, you went on Celebrity Jungle, which yeah. you finished third. Yeah. How was that experience, Jimmy? Oh, I went in there purely for the money. And, um, <laughs> was that after you were bankrupt? No, I, I, yeah, well, I weren't bankrupt. I've, I might have been. I don't know, but I, I had no money. That was a. Uh, they come to me and said, do you want to go in? I said, no, nah, for about three years. And then I said... 
to my manager at the time. I said, ring them up, see if they're interested. And luckily enough, they was. And I went in it and um, Katie Price was in it at the time. And so Ant and Deck are coming to the, you know, you sit on them like benches in the morning and Ant and Deck are coming and they're all the celebrities in there and they're all going, oh, I hope it's not me, I hope it's not me. I'm like, it's not going to be us, is it, when she's in here? Do you know what I mean? Because they're all like, she just finished with Peter Andre. So they sort of had a love-hate relationship with her. Anyway, fair play to her. She'd done 11 trials, 11 times she got picked, and she'd done 11 trials, and she got maximum food every time. Do you know what I mean? So she mm. was, the we used to call her the ranger girl. And um, it was good camaraderie in there because you got no phones, and you, there was a lot of sitting around. And my job was, Gino said to me, just keep everyone away from the kitchen and I'll make us food with what we've got. So I would go to everyone else. Look, he's a fucking professional chef. Let him cook. And so I kept everyone. Uh, Joe Bogner was in there. He got a bit um, He got a bit angry a few times in there. But um, it, it was an experience. You, you should go in. Yeah, a couple of years, man. I'm still raising yeah. the bar, raising my profile, man. Yeah. man I'd love but to But would do you something. go in there? Yeah, yeah. Did they do know anything you, for money, but Jimmy. Did they, well, but, I mean, would they know you'd go in there? Did they know? Yeah, they'll know now. They know now. Yeah, yeah, but maybe two or three years, I'm still growing the brand, growing my okay. name. So, like, I've got a boxing event, that's how I've got a black eye, I've been sparring. Yeah, I've I've got seen a, that. Yeah, I was got, wondering that. Yeah, I've got a boxing event on the 2nd of October in the AO Arena, 21,000 people. When's that? The 2nd of October. I'm coming. I'll get you a ticket. I'm coming. 21,000 people, I'm six coming. different fights, like... Because you're doing well, you get these opportunities, so they're paying us a good few yeah, quid. Yeah, yeah. Plus, I'm I, I'm all about promoting my brand as well yeah, yeah, and yeah, promoting yeah. my mm. name. And it's just the opportunities of meeting new other people. I'm in there. It's, I've got a f- newfound respect for boxing. Every man yeah. thinks they can fight, Jimmy. Yeah, I know. But see when you go under those ropes. I know. Fuck I know. me, man. I know. But, Everyone can throw a few punches. Yeah. You get thrown a few back by someone who knows what they're yeah, doing. Yeah, yeah, because I used to do a bit of pad work and I used yeah, to right. think, fuck me, I can punch. Yeah. Pads don't hit back, Jimmy. No. See, when I'm, in, I'm sparring with a big guy, Craig Beatty, used yeah. to play with Celtic, a guy, um, Chris Bongard, he fights for Bellator. Yeah. They just fucking pung on me, Jimmy, yeah. batter me. And but it I'm, keeps you fit, eh? Yeah, it keeps me fit, it keeps yeah. me on my toes, but every time I get in, there's always an element of fear. Yeah. It's the fear of getting embarrassed, the fear of getting knocked out or so many. But again, the feeling that I've got after it, Jimmy, like no drink, no drug, no yeah. bet I could have would give me that feeling of succeeding. And you and you live in it properly. You yeah. you're making real memories. Mm-hmm. When you're drunk or stoned, you're making memories but they're not real. Nah, definitely not. No. Like, like for you even thinking about winning titles still and is a beautiful yeah. thing. Oh man, I, I, goes, I, I I just I I've I've i jump out of bed. Yeah. You know what I mean? Where before I'd like fucking Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> no, not yet. Yeah, hiding. You wrote yeah, your first book was out in ninety eight as well, Jimmy. Yeah. Is that behind Behind the, the white... uh, behind the whiteboard. Then I done a, another one second win. I got one more book mm-hmm. that we're gonna do. Um we're gonna do when we finish um playing, you know, just um just like the whole package sort of thing, you know. They want me to do it now, but I'm too busy practising. How do you feel when you released your first book? Um, a little bit embarrassed because my mum was uh, still alive, you know, and, uh, you know, there were things in that book that she obviously didn't know I used to get up to and all that, you know, so I'd um, pre-warned her, but uh, I still got, I think I still got a clip, even though I was like 30 odd, you know. So. But fuck me, Jim, with the memories you must have gave your mum and dad. Yeah. Like, I know, I had some, I had some wonderful times. Unbelievable. Me. They must have right. been so proud from the kid from where you grew yeah. up to then. Be one of the greatest snooker players of well, all I, time. Well, you know, I'm a, I'm a kid from Tooting, you know, and I had the Rolling Stones play at my 50th birthday party, you yeah. know, and I'm standing there like that mm-hmm. thinking, what the fuck's going on here? How so did the relationship between you and Ronnie come about? Well, our kids went <coughs> to the our kids went to the same um, school together. Uh, in Wimbledon, Leah and Lauren, and I didn't think for a minute he knew who the fuck I was. Why? I, I don't know. I'm a bit like <coughs> you. you. You don't think you got that? Oh fuck me, you man! I grew up with you in the eighties. Yeah, but you got no. My dad fought, loved it, you. But you, thanks. But you, you don't think you're anything for some reason. I don't know if it's where I come from or what. I don't know. You mm-hmm. didn't have that. You didn't have that belief, you know. And you, there was nerves and shyness and everything. Anyway, um, she was. Um, about six, my daughter. She's 41 now, so 35 years we've been pals. And uh, our kids were in the same play together. And 
I heard that he'd been to the school now and again, and we'd never <clears> part. We've never seen each other, and then um, we met, and we both fucking about with the video recorders. We couldn't work the video recorders, so we just said, sort of more or less, we met, shook hands and everything, and we both sort of simultaneously said, "Fancy a drink tomorrow?" And uh, it was Christmas Eve. I'll never forget it. And we met in the pub at 11 o'clock in the morning in the Rosen Crown in Wimbledon, which would be our local, because he used to live in Wimbledon, and I lived in Wimbledon. So we met at 11 o'clock. I'm there at bang on 11, and he comes in bang on 11 in his Mercedes. Like He had a big 6.3 Mercedes, a big long green thing. He still got it in Ireland. First ever central locking car. don't know why I said that, but <laughs> it's true. And we drunk in the, we drunk in the pub, till about three o'clock and I think it's then pub shut at three o'clock and we sort of didn't and I took him I said well we go to South London and he drove you know and we went I took him to all the the housing estates and pubs that I knew I took him all around South London and we ended up ended up he got home about two o'clock in the morning and I you know, I got, and he drove all fucking day. I'll never forget <laughs> it. But he's the nicest, sweetest, coolest man you'd ever meet in your life. You know, you should do a podcast with him Definitely. because he's fucking great. Yeah. You look for your partying, Jimmy, but you look fucking great, man. Well, I'm clean now, you know. How long? Um, um, the, um, being clean, you have to tell the truth. So I'd say in the last three years, I've had six times I've had a drink, you mm. know, and the last one was a couple of weeks ago. I'd done an exhibition in, um, where was I? I was in Lincoln. And the first exhibition I'd done for two years and the nerves got me. And when they introduced me, like, I'm only in a snooker hall. I know I'm playing all right. See, that's another thing as well. When your, your game's gone and you've got to go and play 10 no young players and they introduced me anyway, the nerves got to me and I had a drink that night and I was so depressed for about two days that uh, hopefully now that would be another sort of... F for The time before that was Christmas Day. Yeah, it gives you a fright. I st I'd stop before. I stopped for two years before yeah. and then I started again. Yeah. And it, I, I lost track for about a year yeah. just back on the drink, the drugs. Yeah, and yeah. then I realised... They how good my life together, was. Yeah, they? I realised how good my life was. <clears throat> but the two years I was off, I was achieving things then. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Then I fucked it again. Yeah. <coughs> no, I think you have to fall off now and again. Yeah, just to that, remind but, yourself that yeah. that's not what I want to be. No, exactly. And because of the, it was all about me being nervous, then all of a sudden I'd had three, four drinks. Then all of a sudden I'm going to now have 30 drinks. Yeah. Because you get the, you get the taste. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Shocking. So I've got a few comedian friends as well and some of them drink before they go on but yeah. some of them don't because they don't want to have to get used to it to get the confidence to yeah. perform. Yeah. What You must have rubbed shoulders with some celebrities back in the 80s and 90s. What's your wildest party, well, Jimmy? Well, no, the biggest celebrity I've ever known uh, and the biggest sort of <clears throat> person in, in such a big... is, is Ronnie Wood because he's my mate mm -hmm. and he's such a big statue of a person and, he, you know, he's, he's just... You'd have to meet him to explain how fucking great he really is. But my biggest, at my um, my biggest celebrity sort of time, I should say, is I went to Ireland and I played Alex Higgins, and I was in the Gresham Hotel. And this geezer who was the promoter, he said, "There's a suite there. You can stay there as long as you like." He said, "I'll send you up twelve bottles of champagne every day." All right? And we thought, "Well, that's weird." So me and Higgins got a suite. He goes off to Ireland, to um, Northern Ireland. I stay in Dublin, and I had um, Finn Lizzy and UB40. They were in a studio around the corner, and they were in my suite every night, drinking these twelve bottles of champagne. And uh, that went on for sixteen days. I stayed there for. And all the boys at UB40, they've been on the show. Yeah, class man. I had um, oh fuck, who's the main singer again? Ali. Uh, Ali Campbell and... They, they split up now, Yeah, they? it was Ali and uh, the man with the dreadlocks. Yeah. Um, I had both of them on because they're 
distance herself from the other band, but yeah. uh, two great guys, man. Oh, no, listen, huge. Yeah, huge. fucking mega. So, yeah. Mega. And uh, it's a shame now because I think Duncan, their other brother, has took Ali's place and now he's not doing it. And um, they're sort of, they're, there's two UB40. Yeah, guys, they've then. all fell out. It's all get messy. Yeah, it's, all, it's sad when that happens, well, yeah, isn't but it? It's, 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 it's been fucked by managers over yeah. the years, you know. There's what wedges between them and all that. Did you have good management or bad management, Jimmy? Well, I had I had Barry Hearn manage me twice, but he used to say, "You're fucking just fucking nuts. <laughs> Why don't you go to fucking bed?" <laughs> but I'm pals of him. You know, he's done amazing. I've watched his career grow. Um, as I just got in touch with Harvey Lisbo, which is really nice to talk to him. I've been I actually spoke to him last night because he he's 81 and he's still a uh, a concert promoter in America. Mm -hmm. And it's just great to talk to him. You know, he used to say to me, you know, Jimmy, this is, you know, this is madness what you're doing. And I'd be like that, don't worry, it's fine, it's fine, you know. So, mm -hmm. But listen, no regrets. Because you're a very humble guy, Jimmy. Like, even when you, like, people speak about you and that, you, it's like you get embarrassed as well. Like, well. It is a bit, you know, because, like, you know, the, I've been very lucky. I've been given mm -hmm. a good hand, you know, and, uh, you know, I could have played it better, but I'm still... I'm still buzzing, you know, I'm still enjoying it. Uh, how did other players treat you from the younger generation? What and you on the, and the two on that, they still got mass respect for you? Yeah, still, you know, has I, everybody I, got on okay? Yeah, no, I've grown up with all these, you know, John Higgins, uh, Ronnie O'Sullivan's and Mark Williams, you know, we, there's all there's a lot of respect for that, you know, and if you still, and now and again, if you stick it up, you know, on the snooker table, they give you even more respect. Yeah, how's the best talent you've ever come up against? What, best player? Yeah. O'Sullivan. He's the best Ronnie. I've ever seen. Yeah, he's a fucking legend. He's man. incredible. He, he he can create situations from nowhere. He's you know, and he he has a few demons. You know, he's um, he's he's been sober for a long time. He no, does his he running, and you know, keeps him keeps him uh, keeps him sane. I think the running. You know, because when you're a perfectionist like he is, he's fucking great at football. He's great at golf. He's he's frightening. He puts his hand. He's just a natural ball striker. Yeah, he's sickening. He's a funny bastard. See when yeah. he, sl he slaughters the other players as well. Like. No, I don't agree with that. Yeah, but when he <laughs> turns around and calls them numpties and all that, shouldn't be doing that because you know they're they're fucking trying to pay their bills. Yeah, mortgage. he just what is that mentality then? Like, see it be the greatest. You no, know, I've watched like Michael Jordan, yeah. uh, Tiger Woods, and yeah. Ronnie O'Sullivan's like. Yeah. They've kind of all psychotic, but in a, in a good way as well. But then it's also driving them insane by trying to master their craft consistently. Well, well Michael Jordan, you know, he went from being a basketball player and tried to play baseball, yeah. didn't he? You know, and got really good at that. Mm -hmm. You know, O'Sullivan, like, he's now like a top runner. He can run he can run 10 miles in 50 minutes or something, you know, like that's like mm -hmm. great speed. But when he says these comments, I don't think... You know, because he'd help anyone out. Do you know what I mean? He's like one of the biggest hearts you've ever met in your life. But sometimes, when you, when players are that good, or that good at their sport, they don't realise that, you know, some of these players would give anything just to have like ten percent of their talent. You know, so yeah. it might probably get uh, misread. How was it winning the seniors world title? Yeah, it was great. Yeah, I won it. Um, I've won it three times. This Last year was the latest yeah, this, this year I lost in the final 5-3. Uh, but it's great, you know, trying to get um, competitions going. And I, we went, like, people I'd played in China, like 30 years ago, played in the seniors. They're still there, you know, and they come along. So the seniors tour is getting good, but I'm still concentrating on the main tour. Why is all the, a lot of the top 10 players for 10, 20 years ago still in the top 10 of snooker? Why are they so hard to, to beat? The likes of Higgins, Williams, yeah. Sullivan, yeah. Um, uh, Selby, who's yeah. also came on the scene a few years back, but yeah. they're still there. They can still want, even the boy Robertson from Australia. Yeah, absolutely. They kind of got away for three, four years, but then they come back strong. Yeah, I think what that is, is that they're that good and they, their schooling of coming through, of like being an amateur at that time, playing each other, Stephen Maguire, all these top players playing each other so many times and then they all turned professional at the same time and I just think they just were better than anyone else for 10 years and now they're so comfortable in their life and in their game that they play well most times they play yeah 
What's uh, Jimmy White? What's the plans for the future, brother? My plans are is when I say goodbye to you, I am going to pack my suitcase and go on back up to Leicester to try and win the British Open. That's class, man. How do you feel looking back in your career, Jimmy? I, I haven't. You got to ask me that when I finished because yeah. you know I have. I'm far from done. I love that, man. I'm I far from love done, that. man. I'm far from done. For anybody watching, Jimmy, that's. Um, You've had a few addictions, so we'll touch yeah. on one at a time. For anybody yeah. that's maybe battling with gambling addiction, yeah. what advice would you have for oh, them? The, the, um, the problem you've got with gambling addiction is that it, you, you're lying to yourself, right? You feel that this buzz of having a bet is all bollocks, right? Because you can have a £500 bet that's causing you grief or you can have a £5 that's not causing you grief. Just don't have a bet. Just stop betting and see how much money you save within one year what about for anybody that's maybe battling with cocaine addiction cocaine addiction is difficult you've got to go to na you've got to go to meetings you've got to be with um fellow addicts who have stopped you know you've got to sit down and talk about it how it's fucked your life up and make no mistake it fucked me up big time and i battle it all the time you just got to Go to meetings again. Life's biggest regret, Jimmy. Life's biggest regret. Um, life's biggest regret. Well, this the world can be so sad at times. That, you know, I haven't. I'm still like doing the best I can. Yeah. What's your most proudest moment? Um, my kids being born. Watching my kids with their kids. Yeah. What a career, Jimmy. Like, honestly, it's an absolute honour to be sitting across Thank you. from you. You're a snooker legend. You're a legend outside of snooker as well. The things you've achieved. Book offer. But on Celebrity Jungle, finishing third, like everybody knows you, everybody's proud of you, everybody that I've met that knows you speak very highly Thank of you. you. It's great that you're still 59 and you're still thinking about winning tournaments and that goes to show no matter what age you are, the belief and the confidence, anything's possible. I hope you're sitting here within the next five years with a world title. Who says anything can be done? Absolutely. And um, for bringing me to the snooker club and letting me interview today, I thoroughly enjoyed that and massive respect to you, Jimmy. Listen, any time. Nice yeah, to meet you. God bless you, brother. And I'll come and watch you win your boxing yeah, match. Yeah, definitely. Go on, son. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Check out more of my podcasts on the right and be sure to like, share and comment your thoughts on this week's podcast. Thank you.